Hello, my name is Bishra. Welcome to Gudera's very first Impact Podcast uh, episode. So throughout this series, we're going to be talking about various issues that is challenging our society and world at large, and then exploring non-profit organization that, that are contributing to solve these issues. So in this episode, we will be talking about health and well-being in gender justice under our Beyond Gender Norms serial. Um, gender norms, roles and relations and gender inequality and inequity affect people's health all around the world. Women and people of other genders are typically left behind in healthcare policies and research. This adversely affects gender justice due to unequal access to healthcare, making it more difficult for women to participate in the workforce. According to a recent Deloitte survey, healthcare costs for employed women is far greater than for men, and this further widens the gender income gap. The average woman pays for out-of-pocket healthcare expenses that are not covered by insurance than the average man of the same age, because insurances generally don't cover overall women issues in healthcare. Other surveys have found that women are more frequently wrongly diagnosed and have lesser access to safe healthcare system than men worldwide. The gaps widen further for women of colour and other minorities. Women's Inclusive Team UK works extensively in health and well-being of women through their various programmes such as COVID-19 support, mentoring and awareness building. Um, I had the opportunity to visit their centre and interact with the people and speak to Sophia Gemma later. Check it out. The Women's Inclusive Team UK is a charity that is working to create a community where Black and ethnic minority women are happy, safe and valued. I visited their office in London to witness firsthand the incredible work they're doing to help our community. They run various women empowerment programs, food banks and a kitchen and a preschool to support women and children in order to create a more equitable society where women can thrive and reach their full potential. I was particularly impressed by the health and well-being programs that they run for marginalised women. My visit was an extremely satisfying experience and I was even more elated to learn that the organisation was giving the 2021 Queen's Award for Voluntary Service for the incredible work that they do. Do check out their work if you're in London. We have with us today Sof um, Sophia Jama who founded the Women's Inclusive Team. She is the CEO who's received an um, MBE uh, from the late Queen and juggles many, many roles. Uh, we at Gudera have been working cl closely with Women's Inclusive Team uh, for a few years now um, as we help, um, help corporations volunteer towards um, Women's Inclusive Team's mission. Um, let's hear from um, Sophia. Um, hello, how are you? Thank you for joining me today uh, for this amazing, you know, impact um, episode. And it was great, uh, you know, dropping by and checking out the incredible work you guys are doing over in London. Um, yes, how are you doing today? I'm doing really well. I'm so happy to be here um, to showcase the work that Women's Inclusive does but also to celebrate the amazing work that do, uh, Good Doer do in terms of being that broker, telling the story of third sector organizations and encourage corporate companies to give back and support because without support, we can't do much. So it's so nice to be, it's a tr truly an honor to be here today with you. Thank you so much. And I completely agree with you. We should be giving back to the communities we belong because that's what makes us who we are today. And um, it is very important to encourage employees at the corporates to, you know, be part of this world and volunteer for the great mission. So um, please tell me, how did you form a women's inclusive team? What is your mission? So let, um, let us int be introduced to the world of women's inclusive team. I, I, gosh, I this was 20 years ago uh, that women's inclusive team uh, started 20 years this year exactly um, and it really started off with a story of us because uh, I was one of the founders with a group of other amazing local women 
And it was our way of solving our own problems. Um, initially, the intention or the mission wasn't to start an organization, but it was to try and see some of the barriers and challenges that we faced growing up. So not being able to attend certain youth clubs because of cultural nuances or racism that we faced at that point, or knowing that we had diverse and unique nuances needs within our community, cultural nuances that weren't being met by stakeholders. So it was really coming together as a collective, women that grew up uh, in the borough to try and use, I guess, women's inclusive team as a tool to solve our own problems, to make sure that girls that look like us, that were like us when we were younger, don't face the same challenges and the barriers. And since then we've grown, and we're still an organization definitely that hears and sees and responds to the needs of our community. And it's very much built on the lived experience of women and their family. We're a specialist Somali led organization, but open to all women. And in Tower Hamlets, actually the area that we're based in, it's quite the largest black community is a Somali community. Um, and so there's unique challenges that we face for being the black community and obviously having layers of inequalities, whether it's Muslim being women and being Mus uh, uh, Somali or black. And so it's how do we solve our own problems, understanding the uniqueness that we bring and understanding the challenges that our community faces. Yes, that, that is that is amazing. And when you said um, figuring out the problems we have, because in life, we always tend to focus on the biggest problem that we have in life. But at the same time, there are smaller problems that makes that problem biggest in our life so um it's also really good to you know come together as a community and understand the challenges even though like small problems or big problems and try to solve it as a community and um getting involved um in community work is um is very impactful because it's it's not just the community but you yourself as well um so can you please walk us through the various programs that you're providing or running currently for the community so initially we started off um, because we all had young kids. So we started off with an early years uh, program. Um, and, and the reason we started with early years is because as I had younger young kids and my friends had young kids, we saw that actually the older generation didn't fully understand the importance of educating kids at a young age and how important that was in terms of giving them the best life to, to teenagehood, to adulthood. And I guess it was just showing them how, I guess, all the research and the understanding, just because we had the language access and access to information like that. And that started off the mother and toddler session and then grew into what we call now the Chicksdown Preschool, which literally provides free childcare for local mums who can go and work, uh, who can go and develop themselves or just have a break for their mental well-being but and we also still have um, uh, drop-in sessions where parents can come and play with specialist uh, support to be able to so give their children a best start and then I guess from that selfish window of the world when I grew up in the borough as a young black Somali teenage girl I wasn't allowed to go to youth projects so we created a youth project that needs I guess meets the needs of girls that look like me um, and making sure that those girls have the same experience as their peers, regardless of what background you are, you still want residential, you still want to develop, you still want to socialize, you still want to have mentors, whatever that looks like. So we still try and uh, we still run those youth projects to make sure those girls have fair and equal access to services. And then we have our Developing Potential project, which empowers and supports women to reach their potential, whatever that looks like, whether it's learning, whether it's their mental health, whether it's about volunteering, whether it's, you know, working, whatever that looks like for them and supporting them flexibly and creatively uh, to reach their, their, their ultimate goal. And then we have health and equality programs that we have, whether it's around mental health and providing, we know mental health, actually all communities face it, but we know that services sometimes don't reflect the needs of, of diverse communities and ultimately those organizations who have excellent services so our NHS for example have excellent services but we know that actually certain communities don't access that so how do we work with them to make sure that those services are equally accessible to to those communities so we have contracts with NHS uh, the mental health specifically and we also have an inequalities program called flourishing communities which looks at how do you make sure that people can you know people that need access to GPs 
who aren't able to go online and type in and, and or pick up a call, but still are able to have access to their GP because health is really important and early intervention is really important. And some works around with Bart's trust around access to maternity um, and making sure that people have access, equal access to maternity, because, of, because we know that data has shown us that women, black women specifically, are four times likely to die as a result of um, giving birth than compared to any other community. And then we have the Mungard project which looks at I guess and supports young kids with special needs um, and so whether it's autism or ADHD so really making sure that families are able to have a wraparound support around their children and advice and guidance as well as our amazing and much needed domestic abuse program for women from ethnic minorities making sure you know we understand their cultural nuances and we guide them through making sure that they have a safe happy and productive life for, for them and their family and often in the organization because we have so many different arms of the organization we describe us we describe ourselves as given a holistic hug to a woman so she might come through advice and guidance or she might want uh, she, we see that she needs domestic abuse so we connect as domestic abuse or she might have a teenager or an early years or special needs child so we're able to really hear her story and make sure that the right team support them and we're quite lucky to have an amazing team that between them speak eight different languages and are all local women with the most valuable commodity, which is passion. Yes, and we can see that passion whilst you're speaking, because whilst you're speaking, the word I was thinking is passion and holistic, and you used both of them in your, you know, in your speech. Um, because when when you when you talk about the things, the programs you provide to the community, it is actually very very holistic. And when we think about mental health, it's not just one thing that makes your mental health better in life. Unfortunately, I wish there was like a magical wand that you know goes around and makes your life a lot easier. But we need many things. There are are many influences in our life that affects our mental health and it feels like with the programs you're providing it's um it gives that you know peace of mind and you know um environment to women to have a better mental health um knowing that their kids will be supporting so support, supporting know, knowing that they will get some employability skills to get involved in the industry and you know um in nhs and it is it is so obvious that you have a very passionate team to do this. Not only I've met some of them um, in London, but the way you speak about them, it's it's also very passionate. Um, and we actually, you actually got us to our you know second point, which was um, health and well-being um, programs for women. So we covered that. And um, what? So my second question is, what are your learnings from working in this space? And um, what are the things that you learned with the programs you provided to the community or, you know, anything that is working, um, you know, malfunctioning in, in, in the UK? So definitely, I think... Um... For me, uh, and I'll use COVID as, as as a beautiful example of how a, a horrific and challenging period that we all face worldwide um, enabled us to think outside the box, enabled us to, regardless of what background or skills or community that you were from, we had this common enemy and we all united to fight this common enemy. And people that have never worked together, worked together, people that never volunteered in their life, volunteered. And we saw the impact of people really giving their time, their energy, their resources to support women's inclusive teams. So for us, we had over 500 volunteers during that period of time. And it enabled us to be able to do more. Um, and ultimately, we have the passion and we have the vision sometimes. We have the lived experience and we know what would help us solve some of our own problems, but we lack those skills and connections. So it's super helpful when people come together um, against, I guess, that that collective unity, um, that collective vision of knowing that actually we desire, if we desire a better world, then we need to sacrifice our time, our comfort, our energy. And a lot of people did that. And so I think for me, definitely, to be able to create um, and do more it's about people coming together and making sure that we hear those people that we don't often hear those people that we don't often see because we're all busy with our life but we know that if we want a greater society a society in which you know there's health inequalities that are being tackled that equality is being tackled across different uh, sectors that everyone's voice and needs are met then it means that we need to give and sacrifice our time and energy and you don't have to be from that community all it is is that you have to be a human being that sees the inequality and you decide and make a conscious effort to be an ally to that community. 
Yes, yes, I completely agree with you. And also about the um, COVID, it feels like COVID um, facilitates the process um, to put mental health on the table again. Because before COVID, um, it was like being talked um, uh, how important it is. But right now, um, it's more about like making policies or, you know, making uh, more researches uh, about like mental health and getting different like diverse communities to be involved in um, mental health um, support. So it is very important that you uh, mentioned COVID and um, you did some programs during COVID-19. Um, you provided COVID-19 supports with your uh, volunteers and um, this is this is very, uh, very impactful. And what kind of reception did you receive um, uh, from the public corporations for your work in this space any support from the corporations or you know any uh, fundings any any help that you received I think it was an interesting time because a lot of corporate companies and as well as funders uh, and grant makers realized that actually certain communities were not historically being funded COVID made us open our eyes it was a sense of awakening where we saw the inequalities and we saw that certain communities were being affected more so death rates were higher for black and ethnic minority communities and then it made us realize that actually because we had the black lives matter during that period of time and so i think there was a sense of realization to say let's look and see actually how in you know how far does inequality go and a lot of funders and stakeholders realized that actually we don't support um you know black and, uh, and women-led charities for example and they decided to do better and in covid there was a huge response things were moving very fast and it was wonderful to have volunteers because it enabled us to move fast and, and meet those needs. But definitely from a stakeholder, stakeholders and funders, for the first time, my charity was funded in a way that it wasn't funded before. Stakeholders witnessed and saw the impact that we were having. They also saw the data of the inequalities that our community faced. And as a result, we were funded. And those funding, whether it was local authority or whether it's corporate companies that funded us, so places like IICF, which is the insurance industry, corporate fund foundation, they funded us, for example, or the British Land for the first time funded us. These funding, or the Canary Wharf, for example, that funded us, these were the first time that they funded us because I think there was a sense of realization to say, well, actually this community is here, we can see what's happening because COVID exposed the inequalities far more than what we, what it did before, uh, far more than what we could see before. And I think they responded to that and they gave us, and, and for me, I see funding, by the way, and volunteering is people giving you the tools to be able to solve your own problem. Because we all know the challenges that we face and funding and I guess human resources and connection and allyship. These are giving us the ability to be able to respond to those needs. And so huge support uh, during that period from housing providers such as, uh, for example, Poplar Harker, who just said, have our premises. Women's inclusive team, they gave us two of their premises and we ended up started a community kitchen, a food bank. I think it was 7,000 and something meals that were given out, hot meals that were given out to the most vulnerable, which every single meal was delivered by a volunteer. Every single food was packed by a volunteer. Every single meal was cooked by a team of volunteers. And also, you know, just making sure that people were being called to make sure that they were well. It took a team of people and it took the support of, I guess, powerful people, stakeholders, people in a position of power to be able to support us and give us and the tools to be able to respond to that. Yes, um, it, is, it is great to work as a community and try to solve the problem as a community, but Somali, Somalian community in the UK, it's it's very big. I live over in uh, over in Wales and we have a, a big Somalian um, community here. So it is, it is very, very important to get acknowledgement from uh, government, from the corporates to understand the needs of people in that community and, you know, um, health representative like yourself to respond to needs of these people because um, it is, it, I'm, I'm sure you already know it. it's it's very challenging to um, accommodate all the needs of your people that's why we need people in the higher ranking or in government in corporates to get involved in this volunteering world and give back to not just give to the communities first so they can give back to their own people and resolve their issues and respond to inequality and racism that is actually um you know growing and you know already has already been in the core of the um 
uh, of the world. So it is really great to hear that you are getting, um, you know, help and funds from public and corporations. Um, I ha which takes me to another question. If you had to share something about the health and well-being of women with another nonprofit uh, working in this space, what would that be? How can you amplify the impact? If we're talking about collaboration, receiving help and support, how would you, you know, describe that? So I think for me, it really goes back to uh, a find out what good work that's being done out there and how do you learn from that really good work that's done out there. Um, so a classic example of us in terms of the mental health area or the GP access area. So first, let's let's uh, share benchmark. Let's share what the good practices look like. I also think representation is really important. Um, you can't, you know, provide a service and say that service is for everybody, but actually the, the staff or the people leading that do not reflect the local community. And so representation is really important. And language obviously comes with that automatic people have access to those services with better language. And the fundamental thing too, that people start having trust because the people on, on, on those in those organizations look like them. So trust is being built, um, which is super, super important. I think resource and making sure that third sector organizations are given the resource because they have a lot of skills and they're grassroots and they are our specialist in their community because there's so many third sector organizations that support different communities but resourcing and giving third sector organizations the ability to think and brainstorm and respond to that and then I always say to people you know steering group and consultations uh, are really important and questionnaires are really important but for a community you've got to be able to empower them because they can't really be able to just sit there and know what box to tick and especially if language is an issue so you've got to really empower them to fully understand you know how important consultation is because people have lost trust from so many surveys and questionnaires and so for me it's about using third sector organizations to make sure that you build on that trust and I think you try as a stakeholder try and gain some of that trust and uh, and challenges or, or mistrust uh, that we saw it, you know again for example just looking at covid um there was a period of time that people were not accessing hospitals not because they um they didn't speak the language of course we know that that's a challenge but i think trust was lost to the point that some of them believed that they were better off at home than in hospitals to have a situation where people believe that going into the hospital is going to be the end of your loved one your vulnerable one because of language because the death rates were going so high because you couldn't communicate because you couldn't visit them and so so I think trust has been hindered and challenged in many ways, and it will take a bit of time to build on that. But I think keeping that rapport, rapport and communication and connection with the community um, is key. Yes, um, I completely agree what you said about the trust, because um, being... Um being a person from a different you know background and from a different country and living in the in the UK and um as you said language is a very very important issue because that's what builds trust uh, as long as you communicate and understand what is being said or what is being done that's how you build trust and i feel like I know English. I I'm not from here. I'm from uh, I'm from Turkey. But even then, I felt really really overwhelmed because first I know the language, but at the same time, do I am I going to have a support in the healthcare system? Am I going to be el eligible for the, for the health healthcare when I try to read about it? It's very complex sometimes. So. I, I totally understand um, building trust is very um, important. Is there any any support that you provide uh, for your beneficiaries, um, like a language um, support in um, NHS or, you know, at the GP? Um, is there anything you, you do for them? Well, just like, you know, for, for us, it's some of the stuff that I've articulated there about representation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I guess a lot of places when we've had these discussions are like actually absolutely like the GP uh, general mm -hmm. practice, which is everyone has a general practice. But we know that some of the issues that came out from the consultations that we did was representation. But we also knew that we do have people that speak the language that can mm -hmm. take those roles. But how do we prepare them so they are ready, able and willing to go into those roles? And so we did an intense program. My colleagues absolutely worked really hard to make sure that a group of women were able to be given the tools to be able to confidently apply for those jobs. 
And then ultimately making sure that those GP practices understand why it's so important for them to have a Somali speaking colleague. And so it took a lot of hard work for them to understand that A, this is a priority and this is what your patients are saying and B, to make sure that local women had the skills and the confidence to apply. And from that, we've had huge numbers of women that have gone into employment in the healthcare system, which is so important because what happens automatically, another young girl that's growing up will go to her GP and see someone that looks like her working there. Or some or she'll go to the local hospital and she'll see someone that looks like her working at the reception or a different field and that automatically then gives her the ability and the confidence to know i can also work in that environment exactly exactly um i was talking with some people from um your organization about how we can actually um you know support people to uh, become interpreters for their communities because that's what we need we need people to get involved and you know learn um not just learn the language but to get the certification to be able to do that um and like there was there was amazing you know ideas about language classes for young people in the community um and so on so we it it makes us understand it's very very important communities to come together as a force and you know support each other but also what I wonder what do you think about how important um, is employee and community engagement um, in this space so community I guess stakeholders need to understand that you need to engage with your community but it's not just a tick box it's not you saying oh by the way we sent a leaflet that had you know 10 different languages so we've engaged with our community no a meaningful engagement is where you have a people that you sit with those communities and you say to them well what does engagement look like to you is it language is it, you know, some, so for example, the Somali community, the language was only developed in the 1970s. And so not a lot of the older women are able to read and write because they never went to school and, and there was a civil war and so on. And so reading, you know, leaflets is not something they're going to be really good at. And we also know when they came here, you know, having their families and so on, that they haven't been able to build up their English language. And so for them, it's about the video. How does the video engagement and awareness and campaign look like? How do you as a stakeholder invest in those communities in a meaningful and get a positive engagement way that's productive? And that's simply by making sure that they have staff that look like them. It's making sure that you go to them in those community organizations, that you engage with them in a way that, that, that is respectful um, and also uh, considers their needs and their understanding. And I think ultimately you need to invest in that. You can't expect the community to come and do surveys and consultations, but that you're not giving them their, their expenses for just traveling there or their food for the day. If they're spending four hours with you to help you to be able to not only engage with them, but their community, then you've got to be able to have the resources to, to make that happen. And so I think definitely community engagement is key, but doing it properly and not doing it as a tick box. Yes. Yes. Um, and apparently there is there is a term in psychology, which is bystander effect. You you realize that things are going really bad around you, but you can't take um, actions because you, you feel like you can't change anything on your own. But thanks to organization like yours, um, creating this collective environment, collective, you know, movement for people to get together and, you know, get their voice heard, basically, and, you know, make sound, make make noise to um, get people in the higher ranking to hear what they want, what their needs are. So um, you can't just force people to, you know, get together. But um, as your amazing organization facilitating this uh, path for, you know, employees or, you know, communities and like people in the communities, um, I'm sure like this whole all volunteering world or getting involved in communities is hopefully and hopefully um gonna get um bigger so we're kind of like getting towards the end of our you know conversation which is going um, absolutely amazing um it is so great to you know get insight about um a community um that i've uh, never been involved in, uh, unfortunately but after the visit i paid in london um and after the talk with ikram and zainab um i told them that i will definitely go to the uh, somali community center in cardiff and see what they are doing and you know the project so um but can you please also give us how we can you know amplify uh, impact in this space personally i will do it for myself to you know amplify this effect after this conversation but is there any tips that you can give us to amplify the effect i i think it's um i always say to people actually we underestimate the word volunteering volunteering your time your intellectual ability your passion your connection is actually a form of donation 
Um, we think about donations as just being the financial giving, um, but actually the most valuable commodity is when someone comes in and shows up with passion and their time and they don't hold back their intellectual ability because they want to support you because they don't necessarily have to be the, the you know a part of an organization to be able to support. You don't even have to be, like I said before, a part of that community, but your allyship towards humanity and making sure that people that want to do something great and help other people are supported and uplifted to do that. And so I think my advice is please reach out to any charities that's in your area. You know, my board, uh, Women's Inclusive Team, our trustees are women that are from all communities. I mean, go in our website and read all about them. They are amazing women from different diverse backgrounds with different skills, but all of them have a passion to make sure that they help black and ethnic minority women, even though they're not black and ethnic minority themselves. Our volunteers aren't necessarily all black and ethnic minority, but they want to sub support women. They're not even women, some of them, but they want to support women because they know that there's inequalities and there's gaps in our society. And that those gaps in inequalities can only be tackled if we unite together in, and collectively try and support uh, people that are doing the work. So please reach out to whether it's schools, whether it's uh, other boards and charities, whether it's a volunteer days, whether it's, you know, doing our garden or, you know, some people might have outdoor spaces. You know, please be creative, offer your services with the condition of not wanting anything back in return, because obviously that's what volunteering is, but making sure that you will feel the best feeling that anyone can have is when you make a difference to someone's life and know that these charities are making a difference to people's lives, but they need you uh, and every single one of you uh, to be able to donate to your time and your resources. And it could be you making a commitment to say, actually, every year I will donate five days of my of my of my year or 10 days of my year. I will talk to my organization, but I will go and work in a community kitchen. I will work and mentor a young person. There are so many things that you can do. And that together, if we work to, you know, in a collective way, we can make a massive difference. Everything you just said, it just puts a big smile on, on, on my face because every time I volunteer or work in a volunteering activity, I call it like a butterfly effect. Because sometimes volunteer things, oh, it's just, you know, half an hour or it's just like five days of my of my year. But at the same time, there is a we, we need to understand the impact because they, they may think, oh, it's just half an hour spent in the kitchen. But at the same time, the impact those beneficiaries are going to have in their life, it's massive. And we don't know how it's going to entail things in their life and how it's going to change our future. Volunteering, it's it's not just changing the world, but also changing yourself, changing the perception of helping other people, not, you know, helping just yourself, but understanding there are people out there who is going through big challenges and, you know, giving back to them and supporting as much as so that, you know, um, as collectively we can have um, better futures as um, you Absolutely. said absolutely um, there's a there's a beautiful saying that when you give uh, and this you know when you give you get back and you get back in volumes and actually by you giving and I know so many volunteers that have written back to me during COVID they led on projects they operated and uh, were operating uh, you know whether it's a community kitchen or the school program that we we're running and those women have come back and said actually putting that on my CV career-wise I've been able to get on to bigger and greater things so the reward is so huge on a personal level just like you said whether it's just opening their eyes and some of these people that worked with us have never worked with black and ethnic minority women and that was the first time that they did that but so it broadens your horizon but also it gives you the ability to tell more on your CV of how of an amazing person you are supporting people that need so actually the benefit is so huge that we can't even describe it. Yeah, I feel like um, you and um, me as personally, because I am a big part of like volunteering uh, family as well. Um, we are blessed with amazing people, you know, doing this amazing work. I mean, yourself started this whole, um, you know, women's inclusive team, which is creating a massive impact in the in the community. Um, and I'd like to, you know, um, know some some of the people that would like to nominate, like three or four people or nonprofits that you think are doing great work in this cause area, so that you know our audience would have, um, you know, better understanding about the kind of impact you would like to, you would like them to understand and also be part of. I guess for me, there's so many amazing people, and um, it's extremely hard to. <laughs> 
to, I guess, uh, say a few people, but all the women on our trustees, some of them volunteered on the ground during COVID or before COVID, and then put their name against the organization and took a responsibility. And they're all volunteers, the trustees. And so it's so wonderful to see women that are powerful women that are doing amazing stuff in their career, uh, in their corporate world, some of them, um, but still willing to give back. And so there's a list of women that I want you to go on our website and see because their details are there. There's also organizations that I am super passionate about, which is Solace, for example, which is violence against women and girls. Um, and especially now that we've just ended a period of, I guess, just that campaign and awareness around violence and, against girls and women, they've done some fantastic work around making sure that every girl and woman um, have a life where they are free from being discriminated or experiencing violence, which is so important. And then there's local organizations such as, you know, Shardabia, um, which is a local organization that brings faith and, and, and community activism together in such a beautiful way, which is really, really important and inspiring to, to, to see. Um, but my, my uh, ultimate goal is to say that actually all the people that I can't list now, the 500 people that came and volunteered with us, over 500 people that volunteered with us, um, I want to say a huge thank you to them. And I want to say thank you to the members who have gone above and beyond to make sure they tell their story, their lived experiences. And so I think there's so many people here. I don't know for sure if I can name all of them, but they know who they are. And I want to say a massive thank you to them for supporting Women's Inclusive Team and most importantly, those vulnerable women who would not have had a voice. And there's also people that aren't charity, um, but are like the British Land, which is Broadgate or IICF, who are corporate companies, um, or the Canary Wharf, who heard the story of Women's Inclusive Team and saw the gap in the provisions that are in our local area of Black and ethnic minority being supported, who then ensured that we had the tools to be able to support those women. Yes, um, there are, as you said, there are many people, many organisations out there, you know, doing great work and um, supporting um, people who need this help. Um, but I thank you for doing this great work, starting this great initiative to support um, the community and people who are not part of the Somalian community, which makes it more inclusive. That's what we need. We, we need also, you know, supporting our communities, but also people outside of our communities. Um, thank you so much for being here today. It was an absolutely amazing experience for me to, you know, um, get to know your experience, pick your brains on like how to create a my more diverse um, environment here in the UK first and hopefully in our world um, to tackle the um, you know problems that we have in health and well-being and gender um, gender agenda so thank you so much for your um, great 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 insights about um, the topic thank you thank you and thank you for having me and carry on good doer bringing a bridge between charities and corporate companies to make sure that our needs are heard by those amazing corporate volunteers who will come and volunteer with us more. So thank you.